Clouds gathering. A bird flying. A tree moving in the wind. A man walking. A rat running in a wheel. A fish swimming. All of these stimuli share a unifying concept, movement. How these independent stimuli and their unifying concept are processed, learned, and retained as memories is a question that can be addressed by considering Donald Hebb's three postulates. Hebb was a psychologist whose work and insights formed the foundation of biopsychological research on behavior, the conscious state, learning and memory, motivation and attention, and other phenomena. In his book, The Organization of Behavior, Hebb presented an outline in the form of three postulates. These three postulates are the synapse, the cell assembly, and the phase sequence. Hebb's work helped bridge the gap between neurophysiology and psychology. Further, Hebb's work has influenced research ranging from neuroscience and psychology to computer science and artificial intelligence. Such research gained momentum with the discovery of long-term potentiation, also known as LTP, in the hippocampus by Timothy Bliss and Tadia Lamont. The aim of this video is to explain and tie together Hebb's three postulates with Bliss and Lamo's findings in the hippocampus. Further, the mechanisms for synaptic learning and the mechanism for a train of thought will also be explained. We will begin by providing a sketch of Hebb's first two postulates. We will then explore these ideas in the context of our experience of daily events, such as clouds gathering in the sky, a bird flying by, seeing a tree in the wind, and so on. As you see here, the human hippocampus runs posterior to anterior. The hippocampus plays an important role in the consolidation of memory and spatial navigation. As we enter into the hippocampus, we see that it has a series of excitatory connections between distinct cell groups that are denoted here with a stylized and colored rendition of their unique morphology. In the hippocampus, an incoming signal will travel along a unidirectional path, beginning from the pyramidal cells in the entorhinal cortex, across their axonal tracts called the perforant path, to the granule cells in the dentate gyrus. From the dentate gyrus, the signal continues along axons called the mossy fibers, which synapse with the pyramidal cells in the CA3 subfield. From there, the signal travels along the CA3 pyramidal cell axons, collectively called Schaefer collaterals, to the CA1 subfield. Again, for clarity, an incoming signal will travel through the hippocampal regions in the following order. From the pyramidal cells in the entorhinal cortex, along the perforant path axon fibers to the dentate gyrus, from the granule cells in the dentate gyrus, along the mossy fibers to subfield CA3. And finally, from the pyramidal cells of subfield CA3, along the Schaefer collaterals, to the pyramidal cells of subfield CA1. Let's have another look. In his first postulate, Hebb proposed that when an axon of cell A is near enough to excite a cell B and repeatedly or persistently takes part in firing it, some growth process or metabolic change takes place in one or both cells such that A's efficiency as one of the cells firing B is increased. Bliss and Lomo by chance noted that if they briefly stimulated a group of cells in the entorhinal cortex, that in the future, the postsynaptic response in the dentate gyrus granule cells was potentiated.
This long-term potentiation, or LTP, is a long-term increase in the strength of synaptic weights as a result of brief but intense periods of synaptic stimulation. Two key principles of LTP quickly emerged. Firstly, the persistence of LTP. It can last for a long time, sometimes for days or months after initial stimulation. Secondly, the input specificity of LTP. Only the synapses that are activated are potentiated. Hebb had suggested that learning and memory occurs as a change at the cell-to-cell -cell connection. As we look closer at the axonal fibers arriving from the entorhinal cortex and synapsing on the dendrites of the dentate gyrus granule cells, we can see the boutons or synaptic knobs that Hebb suggested are the site of growth or change in neuronal connections. Further, as mentioned earlier, there is input specificity. That is, only the stimulated synapse will become potentiated. Bliss and Lamo's findings created the foundation for further research in synaptic plasticity in the hippocampus. Bruce McNaughton and colleagues were subsequently able to identify and describe two other mechanisms that were consistent with the Hebbian synapse. First, cooperativity. Many synapses cooperate together to produce LTP. Second, associativity. If two distinct cells or groups of cells fire at the same time, are temporally convergent, the postsynaptic cell will become potentiated to predictably respond to later stimulation from either cell. Using lower intensity stimulation to activate a smaller number of cells will not be sufficient to cause a postsynaptic response. But if you activate enough synapses to get the postsynaptic cell to fire, the synaptic connections will strengthen and become potentiated. So, using an intense burst of stimulation to cause simultaneous, temporally coincident activity in presynaptic cells will activate enough synapses that will converge to elicit LTP of the postsynaptic response. Associativity is roughly analogous to cooperativity. However, in this case, the activated cells are spatially separated. Similar to cooperativity, activating a small number of cells or synapses is not enough to produce a postsynaptic response. However, if you stimulate the synapses of two separate sets of cells that converge on the same cell, where one of them already has strong synapses with the postsynaptic cell, their joint activation will produce LTP of the postsynaptic response. In future trials, the postsynaptic cell, having become potentiated, will predictably fire an action potential in response to an incoming signal from either of the two associated cells. A quick review. Three key properties were seen in synapses in the hippocampus that align with Hebb's first postulate. One, only activated synapses will become potentiated. Two, the postsynaptic cell must be depolarized in order to become potentiated. And three, a weak synapse activated at the same time as a strong synapse can become potentiated. Hebb suggested that any frequently repeated stimulation will lead to the slow development of a cell assembly. And what we see here is that in the hippocampus, a group of neurons are able to function as a part of a cell assembly. That is, given a strong enough stimulus, a series of cells that are connected will become potentiated and function as a unified system in response to subsequent stimulation. 
This is known as the Hebbian cell assembly. As Hebb stated, groups of neurons that tend to fire together form a cell assembly, whose activity can persist after the triggering event and serves to represent it. Or, in other words, cells that fire together wire together. Now let's try to connect the various mechanisms of learning and memory in the hippocampus with Hebb's third postulate, the phase sequence. The phase sequence is what Hebb predicted was the mechanism for a train of thought or stream of consciousness. To do this, we will return to the environmental stimuli we showed earlier. Recall that in his second postulate, Hebb suggested that any frequently repeated particular stimulation will lead to the slow development of a cell assembly. What you see illustrated here in the brain is the arousal of one unique web of activity in response to one unique sensory event, clouds gathering in the sky. Each of these six moving images illustrates one unique concept or idea, or in Hebb's terms, a perceptual element or event. And as a group of ideas or concepts, they share a unifying concept, movement. In order to elucidate Hebb's postulates, we will explore each as a unique perceptual element. Later, we will discuss their unifying perceptual element of movement. Hebb predicted that the formation of a cell assembly can act briefly as a closed system after stimulation has ceased. It constitutes the simplest instance of a representation. So, whenever a change of stimulation produces a transient but selective activity, the necessary conditions are provided for the formation and activation of a new cell assembly. The brain activity visualized here as a three-dimensional web of activity is what Hebb called a phase cycle. In this case, the phase cycle represents a rat running in a wheel. So, to be clear, each of the brain activity illustrations you have seen so far corresponds to the phase cycle in a cell assembly. Hebb predicted that a phase cycle might last for perhaps 1 to 5 or 10 seconds, which is the apparent duration of conceptual processes in humans. And as we process a sequence of sensory information, the diffuse firing in a succession of cell assemblies will create a series of independent phase cycles that will temporally overlap and interfacilitate as a phase sequence. So, what you see illustrated here is the temporal overlap and transition from one phase cycle to the next. This sequence of physiological representations of stimuli depicts the occurrence of a phase sequence. Thus, the Hebbian phase sequence consists of a series of phase cycles because perception is constituted by a temporal sequence of activity in various brain structures. Now, let's recall that the unifying concept among the six stimuli presented here is movement. As we can see in the corresponding patterns of brain activity, the six different patterns of activity will share common regions in their phase cycles. Hebb suggested that temporal overlap due to the transient nature of phase cycles would establish facilitation between them through the chance anatomical interconnection and enlargement of synaptic knobs, as we already saw occur in the hippocampus. According to Hebb, with six systems of perceptions involved, each can become integrated with any or all of the other five via synaptic strengthening. Each perception will then be able to facilitate activity in any or all of the other five. This interfacilitation will result in a new superordinate system. We've illustrated this interfacilitation between the six original stimuli as a new phase cycle that represents the concept of movement. We will call it cell assembly M. The original six phase cycles are now part of a distinctive whole, the superordinate perception of movement. The resulting superordinate system of activity or cell assembly M, is itself a new percept, but it is by no means a sum or hooking together of the original six percepts. The interfacilitation between the different cell assemblies has formed cell assembly M. This new cell assembly represents a new unifying percept.
I've suggested that, when cell assembly M has become organized, its activity can intervene between the activities of the subordinate assemblies and their phase cycles. So, when an external stimulus causes arousal in one cell assembly, that structure will arouse cell assembly M, and cell assembly M will help arouse other cell assemblies and initiate a phase sequence. This is then how a train of thought can be triggered. What you see here represents a train of thought, a phase sequence triggered by one stimulus, for example, a burden flight. Seeing a burden flight will cause a recall of the concept of movement, the phase cycle that is represented by cell assembly M. Cell assembly M will in turn arouse recall of the other stimuli, such as a rat running in a wheel, a man walking, clouds gathering, a bird flying by. This train of thought is a phase sequence representing the memory of the initial stimuli. In closing, Hebb's conclusion about his three postulates as they relate to consciousness was this. Hebb suggested that consciousness, then, is to be identified theoretically with a certain degree of complexity of phase sequences, in which both central and sensory facilitations merge, the central acting to reinforce now one class of sensory stimulations, now another.